Thank you, Dean. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, here we are once more and again, God, asking that you would now prepare us for your word. Oh, God, that you would remove any hindrance or distraction, anything that is not of you, God, away from us right now, that we would receive what you have for us on today. God, I ask that you would remove me out of the way, that you would hide me behind your empty cross, and that your word alone would come forward, God. Use my mouth, oh God, as an instrument uh, to tear down strongholds, oh Lord. Speak your word and have your way. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, uh, would you turn with me to the book of John? Testament book of John. John chapter 4, starting at verse 46. John chapter 4, starting at verse 46. If you find it, would you please rest on your feet? You can, if you have your Bible, your Bible app, iPad, phone, tablet, whatever you use. And if you got it by memory, hey, hey. <laughs> Somebody has it next. So if you have it, would you please rest on your feet? We'll have it on the wall. John chapter 4, starting at verse 46. Man, I don't have any hearing any pages turning, so I'm assuming you've got it already on your app. The New King James reads as such. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Uh -huh. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. Mm -hmm. So the father knew that it was at the same hour which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. Uh -huh. And he believed, himself believed, and his whole household. Yeah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Just for a few minutes, I would like to speak from this subject matter, I believe. Real simple, I believe. Book of John is an interesting book, different from the rest of the four Gospels, in that John discloses the purpose for writing his book. He says, I have written these things so that you might believe. So everything when you read the book of John, is for the purpose of leading you to believe in the Jesus that John has a relationship with. Uh -huh. uh, this is the second of seven miracles that Jesus does in John that stand out above the rest that lead us to believe that Jesus is the Christ. And the reason why uh, your belief is so important is because your behavior is tethered to what you believe. Come on, come on. Uh, let me see. Uh, if you believe that you are an athlete, regardless if you are one or not, you will go out and you will try to perform like an athlete. If you believe that you can sing, whether you can or not, you will lift up your voice and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And that's all right. If you believe, amen, uh, it goes both ways. If you believe that you are a failure, right. yeah. mm, chances are that whatever you put your hands to do, you're going to fail based on what you believe. If you believe that it's okay to be in a high seated position, such as the presidency, and be racist, Misogynist, sexist, you may vote for, amen, based on what you believe. If you believe that 
there is a man from Galilee who hung, bled, and died in your stead on Calvary's cross, was in the tomb for three days, and was resurrected on the third day, it may change the way you behave because that determines, I mean, it will change the way you think because of what you believe. Uh, so, then, we get to the text. We meet a man who we have already established has a strong belief. Uh, if you read in the preceding chapters that we didn't cover, you find out that in Galilee, Jesus has an issue with Galileans. Because whenever he does work in Galilee, they don't receive him as the Messiah. Uh, he puts it like this. In a, prof in, a, in a hometown, the prophet is without honor. Meaning that I can show up at home, amen, do all kind of good things, but my community won't receive the good that I do because of familiarity. Oh, amen. That's a word for homecoming, amen. You may have been here all the time, may feel like that's home, but guess what? This is a place where God can receive your work still, just the same way Jesus still did it in Galilee anyway. So he tells him, uh, he believes, excuse me, he tells him he believes. Um, he challenges his belief. This is interesting, church, because these Galileans don't believe or don't receive Jesus as the Messiah, yet still they believe the work that he does. Which leads me to understand that it's possible to believe in Jesus for the sake of his works without actually receiving who Jesus is. Uh oh. And let me put it like this you'll look after Jesus' hand, but you won't look for his heart. You'll come to Jesus based on what he can do and not because of who he is. Uh, you'll come to church looking for stuff rather than to worship the Savior. You'll come looking for things that pass away rather than looking for the thing that never fades. Uh, you'll come to this place, you'll come to Jesus wanting more out of him than what he already is. And he is everything that you need. Uh, Jesus puts it this way, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be added on to you. But they had, they had it backwards, amen. They had the horse up before the water. This is what happens, church. Brings me to my first point. That this man, his belief in Christ, caused him to beg for his child. All right. yes, sir. I like this church because this is a nobleman. Uh, some of your translations may say a royal official. Right. This man was related to King Herod. All right. All right. Big shot. Worked in the big house. Amen. He had all of the benefits, all the accoutrements, had a little money in his pocket. Ooh, but let that be a word to somebody today, that no matter how much you attain, no matter how rich you are, trouble can still come your way and hit your house. But what I found out is that no matter how rich you are, no matter how poor you are, we all come to Jesus the same way, on our knees and broken and in need of some help. Uh, but his belief caused him to beg for his son because this is what we found out in Jesus that nobody can do the things that Jesus can do so when your child is sick on to death the money ain't gonna help doctors are not gonna help uh, wishful thinking ain't gonna help meditating ain't gonna help sending good thoughts in your direction ain't gonna help the only thing that's gonna help is if you call on the name of Jesus and like TLC I ain't too proud to beg I'm gonna go to Jesus cause I know that Jesus can do for me what I can't do for myself uh, but there's a pride issue there too, church, that some of us have to learn how to overcome, that we won't come to Jesus because we believe that we can handle it ourselves. Uh, you can't have a Savior until you understand that you're in need of one. And acknowledging that you need a Savior first acknowledges that there's something about you that needs saving. Uh, that means you're not perfect. That means you don't have it together all of the time. Amen? Amen. Uh, but his belief in Christ caused him to beg for his child. The Bible says that he implored Jesus. Yeah. That's a big fancy word that simply just means he begged him. Yeah. Means he asked him over and over and over again. He didn't just stop with one request and say, well, okay, that's enough. Let me just go my little way. He asked him over and over again. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes, church, that gets difficult, too. Because asking him over and over again requires some work on your part. Uh, but we prefer 
to cut on the light and it gets light. We prefer to put it in the microwave and it gets hot. So we want those things to come in our prayer life. So we expect that one time should be enough. But God says you got to seek first. You got to implore. That means you got to keep coming after him to show him that you really want what you're asking for. And that he can trust you with what you're asking for. He implored him to come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. But there is a problem here, church. Jesus calls him on it too. <coughs> you won't believe unless you see it. That's a big problem with people. That's an even bigger problem in the church. Uh, because we've been given the directives and the tools to understand that we don't have to see it to believe it. Uh, but this man knows that Jesus did some things back in Jerusalem a few chapters ago. He knows that, hey, ain't this the city that you was in when you turned that water into wine? Everybody heard about the wine, Jesus. That you saved the best wine for last, Jesus. And if you can t turn the water into wine, <coughs> I got a son that's about 30 miles away. That if you come and just touch him, I know that you can heal him. Oh, but he missed something here in his lack of faith. That Jesus don't have to show up to show out. Because see, Jesus can step into nowhere, say let there be light, and light comes out of nowhere and lights up everything. He doesn't have to be there to do it for you, amen? Leads me to my second point, church, that his belief in Jesus made him believe Jesus. You missed your shout. Maybe it confused you, so let me slow down a little bit. His belief in Jesus made him believe Jesus. Oh, there's a big difference, church, between believing in Jesus and believing Jesus. The Bible says that the demons believe in Jesus and shudder. That means simply believing in Jesus only qualifies you for demonhood. How? Ah, but if you believe Jesus, in other words, if you believe what he said, that puts you in relationship and you now can stand on what he said and receive what he said. Yeah. Oh, but we'll believe everybody else, won't we? Mm. Uh, you'll turn on the news station. The weather person will tell you the temperature is going to be and you'll dress accordingly because you believe the weatherman. Yeah. You'll go to the doctor. The doctor will give you a diagnosis that you can't pronounce. <laughs> Tell you to go to the pharmacist, the pharmacist will give you a drug that you can't read. Tell you to take these three times a day so you can feel better and you'll do it because you believe the doctor and you believe the pharmacist. You will get on social media, see somebody make a post with a silly meme, and believe what it said, and then start to doubt what Jesus told you. Well, if you can believe the weatherman, if you can believe the doctor, if you can believe the pharmacist, if you can believe the social media troll, you ought to be able to believe Jesus when he said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Believe him. You ought to believe it when Jesus said, I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory. Believe him. When the Bible says that the many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers them from them all. You ought to believe him. I'm preaching better than y'all that non church. When the Lord says, I will supply all of your needs, you ought to believe him when he says, I am the head and not the tail. You ought to believe him when God says, let there be light in your life. You ought to believe him when the Bible says that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. You ought to believe him. Jesus is saying something to somebody right now in your seat. I don't know what he's saying, what he's been saying, but I dare you to believe God and what he's saying and don't just believe in him. Who, Lord Jesus, when my wife tells me she loves me, I believe her. But Jesus said it like this, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should but that be preached my little servant and him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You ought to believe him, church. This is how I know he believed him. Well, beside the fact that the Bible said it, this is how I know. <laughs> it says, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way. Jesus told him, go your way. Your son lives. He believed the word Jesus said went his way. That means for the duration of the period before he can see his son, he now has to walk in the assurance of the word that he heard before he sees what was promised to him. Amen. 
man, let me miss it. Let me break it down. He is convinced that his son is going to live because Jesus told it to him. He hasn't seen his son yet, but he knows that his son's going to be all right when he gets there because of what Jesus said. Jesus said something to you some years ago, and you've been waiting on your walking to see what God is going to do for you. Don't lose heart on your way to your promise. Keep trusting until you see what God said. Amen. I got to testify because I see you still not shouting. Amen. When I was 17, God knocked me out of my seat at a revival being preached by Otis Moss. Told me that you're going to do what he's doing. Yeah. I said, uh-uh. You got the wrong one. He said, no. I got the right one. That's what you're going to do. So I, I accepted Jesus. I accepted my calling. I got on this road to preach it. Not knowing what in the world was going on. But beyond that, I knew that God was calling me to pastor. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, you already see the end, amen. So you ought to know something went right. But let me tell you about the meantime. That while I was walking in my calling, based on the word that he said, I ran into a few closed doors. This wasn't the first church that I had prayed and applied for. And God led me to pray and apply for other churches, but each one of those churches closed the door in my face based on age, education, experience, all that other kind of stuff. But yet still, God showed me a word way back then. It took about a good 10 years. But then I can look back on that time when Jesus said this thing to me and it came to fruition because I kept walking and believing in what he said. Go your way, your son will live. As he's going down, uh, he runs into his servants. I told you he was a big, he worked in the big house, amen? Uh, and so he has some servants, they come up to him and they say to him, your son lives. This isn't news to him. He was expecting this. This is what we call confirmation. Have you ever had confirmation before? Amen. When God told you something, and then somebody came and told you what God already told you to reaffirm what you had been believing the whole time. Ain't that how God works? But what I love about it is he said, when did the fever leave him? He's expecting him to leave. When did the fever leave him? The man said, the seventh hour. So in his memory, that was yesterday. He says, that's the same time Jesus said, your son will live. Chronologically, in Jesus' ministry, before this point, Jesus had not spoken a word to heal somebody in the distance. So this is unprecedented in the ministry of Jesus up until this point. So he's the first to get this type of blessing. But yet and still, there it is at the seventh hour. When Jesus said it, it happens. Because Jesus doesn't have to wait, amen. You have to wait on Jesus. And you have to wait to see what Jesus said. But just because you're waiting on what he said doesn't mean what he said hasn't happened. You just ain't seen it yet. My last point, I'm in my seat. His belief in the Savior saved his son and his soul. Your son lives. Uh, number seven is what we call in the church uh, the number of completion. Every time in the Bible you see this word seven, God has done something significant to put his stamp on it so that you can't question whether or not it was God or not. Uh, so he says it happened at the seventh hour. Seventh hour is the hour between 12 and 1 o'clock. Look at your watch, amen. It's the seventh hour. And I'm wondering, is God telling anybody in your seventh hour right now? Uh, he's speaking to me, church. That man went over your head. You need to get the tape and play it back. That is the seventh hour right now. And I've been preaching for a little bit. And God's been speaking to you for a lot of it, telling you to go. Your son will live. Go. Your job will live. Go. Your relationship will live. Go. Your family will live. Go. Your son will live. Go. Your job will live. Go. Your finances will live. Go. Your future will live. Go. Your husband will live. Go. Your son will live. Go. Your daughter will live. Go. It will live. It will not die. All you got to do is walk it out. How God doesn't save the son 
for the purpose of the son to just be healed. He heals the son for the purpose of them all coming to salvation. Oh, because you can have a healed body and a sin sick soul. But if you don't deal with your sin condition, your healthy body will get thrown into a hole into a hell. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? So then when he gets home, he says, I don't believe. Jesus anymore just because he can bless me, but because he is my Savior. And that's what I want to get to somebody today. That it's okay to ask Jesus to heal your body. And he may. It's okay to call on him to save your finances. But if you don't know Jesus in the heart of your soul, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, if you don't have a relationship with him, it doesn't do you any good. But here's another challenge to you. If you know Jesus, but your household don't know Jesus, you're still coming up short. I know that's a hard gospel to preach, but the Bible says that he believed in his whole household. I mean, everybody he was responsible for. <laughs> He lived in the big house. That means his servants too. He made sure that based on what he had received from Jesus, he made sure that everybody else did too. And this is what Jesus did. Do you know what he did? He died on Calvary's cross in your place. There was a cross that was reserved for you. But he took your place instead. This is real simple. This is real not shouting material it should be. But let's be real for a minute. That we are all sick just like this son. Right. We are all laying on our deathbed. And unless you allow Jesus to have healed you on Calvary's cross, you will die in your place. Yeah. If you don't know Jesus, we offer him to you today. The doors of the church are open. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.